Greetings, ladies and managers, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called The Terran Survivability Onion, written by Tornberry Fay, inspired by a YouTube video by Space Doc. Demi Archon Zizix stood before a class of would-be officers with a grim smile on his reptilian lips. That was not because he was amused, but because of the horrific scarring that forced his mouth to permanently curl upwards. He had earned that scar in conflict with the human race, and all present viewed. Today's topic is Terran Multilayered Events Application, also known as the Survivability Onion, so named for the one of the few palatable foodstuff Earth has ever produced. He clicked a button and the screen behind him formed an image of an onion with helpful labels. Onions have layers, the instructor continued, and thus Terran defenses are likewise layered. We start at layer one, the core of the onion. Don't die. A click filled the adjacent screen with images of human anatomy. When we first wage war against the Terrans, we learn firsthand how remarkably survivable they are as a species. Easy to injure, yes, but surprisingly difficult to actually kill. Humans can lose an entire arm or leg and survive with only basic first aid. And with professional medical assistance, they can eventually recover from almost anything. The only reliable way to kill them is to go for the head, destroy the brain, or decapitate them, failing that shoot or stab them through the heart. Please note, however, their bodies have developed a natural defensive lattice of bone to resist such attacks. It may well sound comical that refusing to die is a strategy humanity would employ in war, but, uh, he paused and touched his scars. I have seen it firsthand in this case. Layer 2, don't be penetrated. This, I am sorry to say, is a product of our own misfortune. Terrans acquired a few of our wall-scale suits and reverse-engineered them. He changed the anatomy diagrams to images of fully equipped First Invasion Era Terran soldiers. Their early wall-scale, which they dubbed uh, Power Armor, was inferior to our own in every aspect. Yet, uh, it worked in terrible concert with their natural endurance. The armor would deplete the energy of attacks enough to turn fatal hits into mere injuries. Which, as mentioned, humans can recover from with a alarming ease. The turnabout of fate enabled them to repel the first invasion fleet and brought the time humanity needed to develop Layer 3. The Terran soldiers changed to starships, needle-shaped things covered in ball turrets and missile tubes. Layer 3 is don't be hit. When it became clear that the first wave was overmatched, they pulled back to the outer planets, whereupon the formative Terran void ships revealed their secret weapons. Counterfire, rather than try and match us in destructive force, Terrans devised guided missiles meant to seek out and destroy our own ordnance. Where this failed, they made use of rapid-fire autocannons to shoot the projectiles down. Our ships of this era had no reliable means to counter such a technology, and, unable to land any significant damage to the Terrans, we were eventually overwhelmed. This leads us to layer four of the Onion. Don't be targeted! The side screens now displayed a strategic map of the Sol system and its surrounding stars. Pioneer ships sent in ahead of the second invasion fleet went dark the moment they reached Sol. We presume the Terrans had erected void mines around their system. Thus, we were forced to fight our own defensive conflict at systems 1A, 2B, and 3C. He used a pointer to slap each star system in turn. The Terrans clearly had the means to safely retreat back to Sol, but we did not. This led to their ships and soldiers developing in ways that favored hit-and-run tactics. Terrans would strike quick and achieve their objectives, then flee the theater of war before sizable retaliation forces could be amassed. If somehow brought to battle, they would likewise flee incessantly until such time that they could either safely extract or turn the fortunes of battle 
their way. You were taught to always attack when you have the advantage in numbers, yes? Terrans agree, but they prefer to wait until they have four or five times our numbers before committing to an attack. Yes, this has meant our forces have driven off Terran armies or fleets twice our size, but such victories were always uh, hollow. The Terrans fled because they wished to flee, and they inevitably returned with reinforcements. Layer 5 is what cost us the second invasion. Don't be acquired. Terran technology advanced as the war progressed. Both their ships and ground troops were refitted with electronic countermeasures that scrambled targeting systems and sent out sensor ghosts to confuse direct fire weapons built to overcome their previous countermeasures. The only reliable means to engage a Terran now is, I am ashamed to say, by direct visual confirmation of the target. Even secondary enhancements like laser guidance or homing beacons still need you to manually require the target first. This lands nicely to layer 6. Don't be detected. The intricacies of Void War are subjects for your peers in the Armada Academy, but suffice to say the Terran War Doctrine evolved into something that any sane warrior would consider dishonorable if not outright suicidal. Terran ships began jumping into system, performing a hard burn for their target, then shutting off every single system on board to drift in cold. Murmurs of disbelief met the statement. Yes, it's true. Often the first indication that the Terrans were present was when their ships powered up and fire point blank, or uh, the scorched regiments of drop troopers onto a planet. Let me make this clear. You will not know your enemy is present until he is already engaged. He brought up a larger star map, one that showed the galactic borders. A line of grey worlds slashed horizontally across it. My treaty, these worlds form a neutral zone between our space and Terran space. Whenever we have sought to expand into this region, Terran ships have appeared Sometimes over the worlds in question, sometimes over the border worlds. Once, once over this very planet. The Terrans never engaged us in these situations. That wasn't the point. Their goal was to simply remind us that they could have engaged. That they dictate the pace of battle. And that there we are helpless to fight an enemy that we cannot find. The screens went dark as Zizek surveyed the class. All bravado was gone from them. His little demonstration seemed to have done its job. Your goal will be to learn how to counter every layer of the onion. Our scientists, strategists, and engineers are working on ways to detect human ships and force them to battle, to overcome their defenses, to disable whatever area denial systems they use to safeguard their star systems, and ultimately... How to actually make them stay dead. It will not be easy, but I swear to you all in the next war, the third invasion will be the final invasion. Sometime later, many, many years later in fact, Demi Archon Zizix once again found himself lecturing on the Terran survivability onion. It was similar in most respects. He himself was older, with more scars, but the bulk of the lesson was the same. The key difference laid at the end. This time, he did not seek to rouse his class with promises of glory. This time, he spoke of something different. With a sigh, the Demi-Archon looked up at the star map on the screen. This neatly brings us to layer 7 of the survivability onion. Don't be there. This map is inaccurate. During the third invasion, we successfully pushed through these systems here, reaching close proximity to Sol. Drone ships launched ahead of the invasion to clear any minefields protecting the system, but the ships could not launch. We assumed sabotage, yet another scrambling system or a, a countermeasure. But no, there was nothing. Now drones couldn't jump into Sol because it wasn't there. The entire star system has moved. We don't know where it is, and we can't even begin to guess how it was done. Sol... It is impossible to invade now because it is literally off the map. 
The elderly reptile let out a long, weary sigh as his eyes stared at the onion diagram on the main screen. Oh, they already do ruin everything, those Terrans. Even onions. End of story. Story number two, Humanity's Bloody Smile, written by Teller of Tall Tales. It has long been debated what makes humans so unique amongst the myriad of species of the cosmos. Is it the durability? Perhaps after all, human warriors have been known to absorb dozens of blaster shots before succumbing. Is it their resourcefulness? It could be. Human engineers are prized and highly sought personnel. Could it be... Adaptability, their determination, indomitable will. I don't think so. Trying to classify these hairless apes in such a way is demeaning. It spits in the face of all that they've sacrificed, all that they've lost and given to those who gave nothing in return. No. What makes humanity so unique, so great, is their smile. Across the cosmos, barring one's teeth is normally considered a threat, but for humanity, it's something different. They bare their teeth at a newborn child, fresh from the wound. But they are not angry. Quite the opposite. They are overjoyed, ecstatic. They bare their teeth for a completely different reason from any other species. But there is more to that smile humanity has than just happiness. No. Humanity's other smile means so much. Back during the Gervac Nivian War, back when I was but a young soldier, still green behind the ears. I had been attached to a human division at the time. We were clearing and securing a small village for a forward operating base when a group of Nivian children wandered our way. The Nivians never shied away from using a child as bait back then. We didn't see the grenade until the lead child held it out to us, a spoon dripping away. A young human male was the first to react, sweeping the child away as he caught the grenade, pulling it tight to his chest as he dove to the ground, laying on top the grenade. He was thrown when it detonated. Viscera coated my visor, but I was the first to sprint to the injured human's side. They grabbed my armor and yanked my face close to theirs, coughing up blood as they asked, Oh, are you are they okay? Oh, oh, are the kids okay? I panicked, glancing back at the now bawling Nivian children as a medic rushed towards us, appearing as though in slow motion. I looked back at the human and nodded. The soldier relaxed, gazing up to the sky, with a smile slowly spreading across his face, revealing blood-stained teeth. Good, good. That's good. The light left their eyes, and it only took the medic a few seconds to confirm the young man's death. I remember checking their breast pocket for their dog tags and finding the photo. The human held a newborn infant up over their face, a wide, bright smile adorning the young soldier's face. A timestamp in the corner revealed it had been taken less than six months beforehand. It was then I understood why the human smiled. Smiled even as they knew they were going to die. They smiled because they loved. They love life so much that they will joyfully give theirs to extend another. That is what sets them apart from all of us. End of story. I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons, Dragzoon WRE, Quantum Wednesday, Ambrose Catal, Lord Ashrakal, Bushmaster177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.